This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. When I say the word reanimation in regards to the human body, it sounds like it's science fiction. But today we're gonna to find out, like we do a lot here on Health Matters, that science fiction is becoming science fact with a lot of hard work by a lot of very smart people. One of them is here with us today, Dr. Justin Brown. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Brown is director of the Neurosurgical Peripheral Nerve Program here at the University of California, San Diego, mm -hmm. where you have been working on making muscles and things move that couldn't move anymore. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. When I started medical school, that wasn't possible. You're, I mean, just people think about this. They get an injury or something happens and their hand doesn't move anymore, it's, it's paralyzed. That's the word that we use. Mm -hmm and they think it's forever. It used to be. But you're able to make that move again? We can make a move again. And believe it or not, this has been going on for about 100 years now, but it's always been in pockets here or there. Some of the things we thought we discovered about 10 years ago, we can look up reports from Russia from 1940 and find somebody there had discovered the exact same thing. So it's not really brand new technology, but I think we have a better grasp and understanding of it now than, than we did back then. Yeah, everything old is new again. That's right. right. <laughs> it, it, it's, to, to talk about this, I think we need to set the stage about how nerves and muscles talk sure. and what, how it works normally and then what goes wrong. Okay. So how does it work normally? So normally the, the brain has to communicate to the spinal cord and the spinal cord has to talk to the muscle to make that muscle move. So just to, to simplify it, it's, it's the cable like your light plugged into the socket in the wall. If that cable's broken, the light goes out. If the nerve has been cut in two, that muscle no longer moves. And so the idea is to bring that communication back to the muscle. So the spinal cord is once again talking to that muscle and causing it to move once again. The, the old days, nerves, once they were cut, if, if you got lucky, maybe they reconnected. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember being taught that they barely grow. Uh, and this is 30 years ago. How do you get a nerve to, to talk to each other again once it's been separated? Sure. Well, the, what a lot of people don't understand is, is once they're separated, there's a part that's connected to the spinal cord and it keeps the wires. There's a part that's disconnected and those wires sort of get eaten up and it ends up in an empty conduit. And the idea is to put the train tracks back together to get this train from the proximal end to grow all the way down to the muscle and the distal end. Unlike that, and people get confused, the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord do not grow well. The peripheral nerves are set up to grow, but there are a lot of parameters that we have to pay attention to how long it's been since the injury, how old the person is, how complicated a nerve it is. Several of these things we want to pay attention to before we plan how we're going to reconstruct. So, so to use your analogy, if it's a railroad track and you've waited too long, it's disintegrated too far, grass has grown over it, it's, it's, it's been destroyed to a point where you really can't get it to grow back in that pathway. That's right. So um, if, if someone has, is it usually an injury mm -hmm. that, that causes this? And what type of injury would you classically see this? So the worst, the worst injuries we see are, are the motorcycle accidents, and, and it's the, the bundle of nerves that come out of the spine of the neck is called the brachial plexus. And when a patient is thrown from a motorcycle and they land pulling their head away from their shoulder, it will often rip these nerves, and so the arm hangs limp at the side. And so that's one of the most challenging nerve repair cases we have. And, and so, I mean, I, I remember when I was in medical school, uh, I was in Connecticut, people didn't wear helmets. Right. And so they would get brain damage. Now with helmets, you're getting the... Uh, it's a lot better to have a, an arm damage than your brain damage. That's right. So um, the, the classically, they have this damage to, the, to, to this complex of nerves that come out of the spinal cord down into the arm. Mm -hmm. If you do nothing, what happens? Well, there's variable degrees of injury. So we, we need to find out what kind of injury it is. Has it been stretched, in which case it 
could grow back or if it's been stretched too far. Sometimes it'll just form a scar tissue there. Or if it's been plucked out of the spinal cord, we know we're done and it's not going to grow back on its own. So you have to sort of figure out what kind of injury it is first and then come up with a plan of how to get it back. There are a number of injuries where we see it looks very paralyzed early on, but within about three to four months, things begin to wake up. So you talked about not waiting too long. That's right. But there sounds like there's, you don't want to go too soon either. Well, you, you want, want to get a chance for recovery. That's right. You want to get your evidence as quickly as possible. So if the patient comes in with a completely paralyzed arm and we, we would then image him and find out, has it been plucked from the spinal cord or can we see separated nerves? What kind of image? Um, a CAT scan, myelogram, CT myelogram, or an MRI. Okay. And so these are, are uh, either radiation or magnetism That's right. using to look at it carefully. Can you see down to the level of peripheral nerve on these kinds of scans well enough to determine the type of injury you discussed, you know, from whether it's been plucked out, mm -hmm. stretched, can you tell the difference? A lot of times we can, particularly the one where it's pulled out of the spinal cord, because when that happens, there's fluid that lives around the spinal cord. And when the nerve has been ripped out from the spinal cord, that little fluid creates a pocket on the outside. So that one you know you... That, that one can be easy. Okay, sometimes. and then the others, if it's close, you wait a little bit to see if they recover? That's right. And, and is there something that the person who's waiting, if somebody's at home and has had this injury, is there something they can do to help themselves? Is there something that the native body does to help reconnect this or if there's stretch to heal it? Well, not a lot that we can do to make it grow better or faster, but the important thing for them to do is maintain the range of motion in the meantime. Some folks will ignore the arm, and then by the time it comes for it to recover, they've developed contractures and their hand no longer opens and their elbow is too far flexed. And then secondary procedures need to be done to loosen it up so that it can move. So maintaining is the big deal. Maintaining it in the meantime. Okay, so um, is, if we weren't trying to reconnect the nerves, mm -hmm. was there anything else? Or, or is, it, is it sit home, pray, and hope? But if somebody doesn't go in and, and, and do something, it's just crush your fingers, pray? If, if we know it's not going to recover, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, or if, if, if it's, it's a plucked out injury. If it's, if it's plucked out back. injuries, that's right. It's, it's just not going to come back. There's no way uh, that, that if it's been plucked out that anything is going to grow back down that to recover that muscle. So, so then what techniques sort of, you, I mean, you alluded to people have tried stuff in the past. Mm -hmm. what, what's led to what you're able to do now? Sure. Um, so the same way people have been approaching spinal cord injury recently is that desire to recreate a normal spinal cord. That's the original way people approach these big nerve injuries, is they wanted to rebuild the nerves the way they originally were intended to be built. So you would take grafts. So every part that was damaged, you'd find a nerve somewhere else in the body, and you'd build a bridge, and we'd do it way up in the neck. The things that we know that, that, are, that impede good success is the distance from the repair site to the muscle, the amount of time it takes, for that muscle to get re and in the amount of time after the injury. And so the strategy is, let's not try to rebuild the normal nerve. Let's try to find a strategy that, that it recovers it quicker. And so one of the best ones we've had is when the shoulder and biceps are up but the hand works perfectly, instead of reconnecting it up here, we actually splice one of the nerves that goes to the hands down here and then connect it about a centimeter away from the biceps. Got it. And, and the idea is that if you get it moving or connect early, mm -hmm. then eventually the, the body will figure it out? The body will figure it out. So they may go through a training phase where he has to make a fist and the arm begins to come up and then the brain will figure it out and after time he just automatically thinks flex the elbow and up it goes. Kind of amazing. It is. <laughs> it is. The brain does amazing things. It, 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 it has so much plasticity or ability to, to make up for things we wouldn't think would be easy to figure out and then make them normal for a patient down the line. It's wonderful. Well, it's funny because uh, we've talked about on, here on Health Matters previously people who have phantom limbs mm -hmm. where they've lost an arm, but they feel like they still have it. Right. It's almost like the brain is still trying to be plastic, still trying to, to make something move, and you're giving it a chance to do that. I mean, you know, this is That's not right. a phantom limb. You're actually saying, okay, here, go play. I mean, you know, connect it and figure it out. That's right. So uh, that surgery, we're not talking about large surgery. This is all very small, delicate surgery. Right. How, how do you do that? Well, we do it with a microscope and micro instruments. We use, uh, when we actually put the nerves together, we use a suture that's probably thinner than my hair with a microscope, and we, you know, actually suture the nerve ends together. I'm sorry, but it sounds unbelievable. We're suturing nerve ends together. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that people, I think, uh, sew hems on dresses or pants, you know, we sew it, those are big stitches. You're talking about very delicate tissue that you don't want to damage it during the procedure. It's already been damaged. That's right. And you've got to put it back together and you've got to dissect it out mm -hmm. and, and do that. There's a lot of training that goes into that. There is. So I, let's just take a second mm -hmm. and, and we're going to torture everybody for a second and tell them 
how many years it took before you finished training, just to get finished training. Sure. So you med school? Did the med school for four years, obviously. And then neurosurgical residency, when I finished it, it was still six years. It's now become seven. And then I did a fellowship in the peripheral nerve surgery, which was a single year. Right. So, so you're talking about 12 years after college. That's right. Before you developed a skill set where you're able to go ahead and do these things. Someone doesn't walk out of, you know, a, a technical school and be able to just do this. This is extreme levels of training, pretty much the highest level of training we have in medicine. Right. I, I'm, a, I'm a pediatric eye surgeon. I didn't spend as many years training as you have. So, I mean, that, that, this, is, this is someone with an incredible skill set to be able to walk in and do that. But you don't work alone when you do all this. You have uh, sometimes plastic surgeons and neurologists, and there's some teamwork that goes in. That's how, right. how does that all work? Yeah, it, it, we have put together a nice center here. So part of the diagnostics in, in getting these injuries figured out is one, having a, the proper MRI protocol. When the patient has an injury to their nerves, they can't just go to any MRI shop down the road and, and get an image that will show us the detail we need. So we had to have radiologists who are willing to tweak what they're able to do to get a better picture of nerves. And then we need a neurologist who understands what I do. Like many neurologists can do EMGs, the, the studies where they put the needles in and test the, the nerves and the muscles, but it takes somebody who's interested and understands what we do to be able to, to, to give the answers that we're looking for. What is it that you're looking for that they, that they need to tell you? What, what, how do they help you? Okay, one is they can give me a little preview on whether something's recovering or not. When, before we're able to see the muscle move, when he puts that needle in there for the EMG and asks the patient to try as hard as he can to move and we hear a little pop, 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 that for us is a nice little preview that probably two to three months from now that arm is going to be flexing without difficulty, so let's not bother repairing that. Let's move on to one that does not give a response. Like every good surgeon knowing when not to operate That's is right. one of the most important decisions that we make. That's exactly So, right. so that information helps. Um, is there other information that they give you? I mean, is muscle damage that's that's irreparable can they find or uh, is there something that would stop you be, not because of a positive but because of a negative well sometimes the, on these nerve transfers so when I'm taking from what I believe is a healthy nerve and I'm plugging it to one that's gone sometimes we'll see a muscle that moves very well but when he tests it he finds out that although it's moving well it's running on uh, one quarter or one fifth of the wires that it should be running on. So when you transfer that, you're probably not going to get the result you're after. So he can come up with what's going to recover and then what strategies that I might want to use will be the best strategies. Wow. I mean, that's, this is teamwork. This is an right. ongoing discussion that must be continuous with you guys. That's right. Uh, plastic surgeons? Plastic surgeons, uh, sometimes the answer is not just repairing the nerve. Sometimes it's using local muscles and moving them into a position that would, that would provide better function. So after I do nerve repairs, if I'm just getting the fingers to close but the thumb isn't positioned right, we, we have to fuse the bone or do something else to position the hand better. And the other uh, use for plastic surgeons is sometimes the patients come too late. So if they come after a year when everything, when we talked about those railroad tracks, the grass has grown over and it's not going to do well, we can actually steal a muscle from the leg and replace one of these muscles and nerve uh, units that aren't working anymore. And I do that as a team. So everybody working together again, that's right. knowing when to deploy who, you know, I mean, I, I'm a sports fan, so I'm thinking sometimes you need a three-point shooter, sometimes you need a center to get a rebound. I mean, you need, you need everybody working together. That's right. Um, the hand is an unbelievable organ. Uh, you and I find motor skills, people who play instruments have incredible fine motor skills, even to write our name is an incredible feat, uh, the practice. How much recovery can you get? Uh, I, I assume it's going to be variable, but to what levels, how good can it get? It, it all depends, so that, as I tell patients, how much is gone, what percentage of the limb is gone, and that gives you a good idea to what percentage I can get back. If you are missing a couple of critical muscles, if, if you can grasp and flex the wrist, but you have no ability to extend the finger, extend the wrist, it's a dramatic recovery, because suddenly they have a hand that doesn't work at all to work, but it's just a few different muscle groups that we're recovering. If there is absolutely nothing going on from the elbow down and we have to reconstruct that from scratch, it's going to be a very rudimentary hand. It will close, it will open, but it will not play the piano when we're done. But close and open is a, is a big advantage. That's right. So from somebody who can't move their hand to close and open, I mean, that's, to me, that's a quantum leap. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the glass is truly half full. That's right. Half empty. So if somebody starts with, I mean, a little bit more, can, how, how, could, you, could you get a lot you know, could you get somebody to play the piano? That's right. So, so the first scenario I described where the, where the wrist and fingers don't extend, we could get him to play piano afterwards. We, we'd be able to get him with independent finger extension and wrist extension. That's so right. when there's nothing left there, no, we're hoping that he can get that cup to mouth. Well, I mean, which is still, again, Which a is good. Deal. Yeah, I mean, to be able to, to, to hold your child or to drink or, or do those things. Um, do, do, do people get back to the point where they can 
get back to their normal activities. I mean, recover, work. I mean, drive. It, use the hand to. That's always the goal is to get the, get them back to the occupation they came from. And so, a lot of times we can, depending on how severe the injury was, we may this may simply be a helper arm from then on out, versus something that he's doing bimanual skills with. So it, it all depends on the severity of their initial injury. So it, you, you know, you've talked about this is incrementally adding on to scientific data that's been collected over many, many years. Is there anything that's been sort of a, a jump for you that's, that's been able to, to say, wow, we can do so much more than we used to be able to do? Or is it these incremental steps, putting the team together, uh, and just hard work? Um, mm -hmm. Has there been a jump that's allowed you to help? Uh, well, I would say the nerve transfer strategy that I talked about has been a big jump because it has taken results and operations that took much longer to do and times and delays before recovery that were much longer and final outcomes that were very weak and turned them into very short operations, short recovery times, good strength. But the other, what I feel like is sort of a quantum leap has been applying this to other types of injuries. So people have figured nerve repair was only for nerve injuries. We've said, well, now that we're using nerves that work and plugging them in the nerves that don't, why not apply this to spinal cord injury or even to stroke? And so we're one of just a couple of centers in the world that's doing this now and seeing good results. Give us an example of what you mean by that. Okay, so a patient who's had a, a spinal cord injury, they say they've uh, injured their spinal cord in the middle of the neck and they lost their hands and they can't walk anymore and they're in a wheelchair. I think Christopher Reeve is somebody that everybody thinks of when they hear that. Sure. Um, they are left with sometimes shoulders, sometimes biceps, and nothing below that. Well, using the same strategy, we can sort of redistribute what's left. We can take, there's a few muscles that flex at the elbow. We can redistribute that down to get in the hands to close. There's a couple of muscles that turn the palm up. We can use one of those to get the fingers to extend. So we're able to take these patients now and give them the ability to get the glass to mouth and do things they couldn't otherwise. Or hit a button on a keyboard. Sure. Now, now they're using a computer and they can communicate in different ways or, or run a wheelchair with a, a joystick. That's another step towards independence. It is. That's huge. And, and if you can just add a little level of function to these patients, it makes a huge uh, difference in their amount of care they need during the day. Now, I'm, back in the day, I remember that there were times when people would have uh, Bell's palsy or other problems with the face, mm -hmm. and uh, they had tumors removed, and we were trying. There would be transplanted muscles and reanimation of the face. Mm -hmm. Is, is uh, some of what you're talking about applicable to that, or did it that is. help with what you're doing? How does that work? It, it's absolutely applicable to that. So we have a facial nerve team, and it's uh, Dr. Nguyen in, in uh, otolaryngology and Dr. Gosman in plastic surgery, and in the same things apply. So. There's reconstructing the facial nerve way back in the bone if it you know, was, was injured back there, but there's also the same transfers. So the chewing nerve, the, the masseter muscle here, which helps you chew, there's a nice big nerve in there that we can connect to the facial nerve. Or the temporalis muscle that lives up here in the head can be connected to the upper face. Or we can go to the contralateral side and wire that over so when the, the right side of the mouth goes up, then the left goes up together. So when they are happy, it automatically smiles. If you do functional MRI scanning of the brain, can you actually see the brain plasticity in action, can you see the brain change how it's approaching its use of some of these muscles or the face or whatever part it is? Because at first it's off and then it has to learn it. Right. Can you watch those changes take place? You can. There have been some centers that have done these serial studies on these things and watched how the, the, the function migrates to different parts of the brain and, and it's, it's fascinating. You can teach an old dog new tricks. That's right. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Um, so the, the, this is incredible. Whenever I hear some of these, I think about um, athletes, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the old Tommy John surgery where you could take a piece of, uh, uh, you know, a tendon and put it in the elbow and make someone throw again and they could get back when they had an injury that didn't work. Um, how could you, I mean, are there athletes who have had injuries or damage on a football field or, or, and, and, or in um, athletics that have numbness or tingling that you do this for? Or is that too mild to go th to put them through an operation like this? Yeah, th those are usually sort of nerve compression entities. So it's, it's a nerve that's still there, but it's not functioning its best. And it's usually because something is compressing. It's, it could be overdeveloped muscle. It could be the posture they've assumed from their activity. And just getting pressure off those nerves usually allows them to wake up and they get back to sports. So they don't need this kind of whole thing that you're talking that's about. That's right. Okay. Um, there are people who have pain. Mm -hmm. in, in their nerves and from compression or spin other spinal cord problems at the, along the way. You're not talking about replacing those nerves. That, that's still traditional, take the pressure off of them. And that's right. Okay. That's right. So, so, so the difference here is these are complete, complete injuries. So a lot of times after we, we have a discussion like this, patients will call and say, I'm a little weak in my grasp. We want a muscle that does not work at all before we go to these types of procedures. Okay. You, you mentioned something that I wanted to just get back to for a second. You said these are short operations. 
It, it depends. Compared to what it used to be. Compared to what it used to be. What does that mean? It, you know, is, is, is to you five hours a short operation? Is it an hour? I mean, how long does it take now for you to, a typical case, how long would it take you? So if we're doing separate nerve transfers in the arm, uh, each nerve transfer can be about you know, three hours. Okay. So previously when we were reconstructing the entire brachial plexus, it could be a 12 hour, 15 hour operation. Yeah, I, I, I wanted people to hear that because in ophthalmology, three hours is a long case. Right, okay. Uh, but, but for neurosurgery, three hours is a relatively short case right, right. compared to a 12 hour previous case. So it's still an enormous amount of work. Uh, we don't want people to think this is you know five minutes and, and you're out to do that. True. Um, there, there's something that, that uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that we need to have too much of a talk about, but it, it's in every show now and in everywhere we go, people are asking both me and you about these things all the time. That's stem cells. Sure. You're not, this is not stem cell based. This is, this is a whole different approach. This is connecting things. Mm -hmm. um, is there, just because people are gonna ask, mm -hmm. is there a role that stem cells will eventually play, you think, in this, in helping connections or in the future? Mm -hmm. I think that there probably will be a role in, in peripheral nerve reconnections for stem cells to sort of enhance how well those wires cross, how well the axons grow from the repair side from one side to the other. I think there's probably an area there where that will enhance things. And then when we get back to the spinal cord, to gain a level or two of function in the spinal cord, stem cells may be able to do that as well. But we've got a little, little more work to do before we're there. Yeah, and, and in medicine, it's often hard work. It, right. it, it sounds sexy when you see it in the newspaper, but there's a lot of hard work that goes in with people's noses to the grindstone. That's right. Uh, and, and an academic center like you and I are at, there's a lot of research labs, there's uh, a lot of teamwork that goes on between the clinician helping to translate that bench research to the clinics. Mm -hmm. The value of being at a place like UC San Diego. That's right. So um, in, in, the, in the time we have left, sort of the world according to you, what would you like to see happen so that, for example, if somebody had an injury, <clears throat> is there quicker detection or getting them to you quicker that you wanna see? Or from a research standpoint, the kinds of things that you'd like to see going forward? Sure, so both of those. Number one is it still seems that across the nation, really across the world, there is a general misunderstanding of paralytic injuries. That patients are told to wait, go get therapy, let's give this a year or two and see how you do. And that's when they've missed the golden opportunity. So if there's one thing I'd wanna get out there is if you have an injury that results in paralysis, come see a specialist soon. Come see him within three months. That's what we consider soon, within three months of the injury. And we can help determine if this is one that will go on to recovery with therapy or if this is one that needs surgery. So the answer still may be wait. It still may be wait. But, but if it's not wait, you've, you've not lost the time. That's right. Okay, so, so get to you a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. I assume that partly means that you are talking to our colleagues out there, That's educating right. them as well, mm -hmm. so that, they, that, they, that message continues to get passed down. So, that's exactly right. I mean, that's part of the teaching efforts that mm -hmm. you do. From a research standpoint, what, what would you like to see happen or what are you working on now? I, I would like to see more focus on, on enhancing regeneration. Now, we've been happy that the peripheral nerves regenerate compared to the central nervous system and they're set up to do so, but I think that can be improved upon. I think that we could maybe stretch the window so that patients uh, don't have to be here within a year. Maybe it could be... Uh, uh, acceptable up to two years after their injury. Uh, is some of the research going into maintaining the distal nerve, maintaining the muscle, enhancing how many axons cross when we repair, I think that would really bring this field in, into the next level. A little more money for a little more research would be okay. That's right. <laughs> that, that never hurts, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? So um, the, the, one of the things that, that you're here is that there's training programs that, that you have here. Um, uh, it must be exciting to be able to pass this knowledge down it is. to the to the neurosurgical residents, et cetera. Uh, do, do they do they get? Because I, I I listen to what you're saying and it sounds near miraculous to me. To them, is it just par for the course? Like like you know, when they pull out their iPhone, they don't think it's that big a deal. I still think it's amazing. Do they, do they think this is par for the course? It, you know, it depends on the resident. There's there's certain everybody comes in with with certain things that sort of light their fire. And the ones that, that like it, boy, they, they get really excited about it. There are others that they've been focused on brain tumors since the medical school and they come in and they say, that's interesting, but I'm a brain tumor guy. Yeah, and then I want to do but, something else. <laughs> uh -huh. But I've had, you know, we, we have residents coming over from other programs now. They've come from Phoenix and from Irvine and to learn this stuff and they're fascinated by it. And yeah. so they want to spend extra time after the residency to learn how this all works. I, I mean, you know, I started the show by saying this is science fiction, but to think of somebody walking in with an arm that doesn't move or, or just is sitting there, and, and no matter what they're trying to do in their brain, they can't get it to move, 
and that you can, they can walk out and now their hand is moving, even if they can, they can just grasp a cup. Mm -hmm. that, that is a gift and a miracle that is hard to even describe yeah. what, what the level of that is. So I, I can't imagine the gratitude that you hear from the patients and, and the impact that it has on their lives. Well, it's a lot of fun to have that clinic when the patient walks in a year later and says, look what I can do now. It's, uh, yeah, I enjoy those clinic visits a lot. A lot of high fives. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And, and more importantly, thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, thanks for having me. My pleasure. You, you've been listening to Dr. Justin Brown discuss something that is really near miraculous. Uh, th the idea that you can make muscles and nerves work that, that were gone is something that is incredible. So I hope everybody was listening carefully. If you know anyone in this scenario and they haven't had an opportunity to be evaluated or they've been waiting, might be a good idea to get them to get checked. This is Health Matters, and on Health Matters, we believe knowledge is power. I'm Dr. David Granite, and I'll see you again next time.